welcome everyone to our final session. Um, this has been a packed, packed couple of days. And talking to people, um, we're hearing that, that a lot of people got what they needed to get and want more. So um, we hope to continue to work with you around these issues. These are terribly, terribly important issues. I think no one challenges that. And we have, uh, we have plenty to offer from our field, and, and that's what we need to do. I'd like to introduce our three participants. They probably don't need any introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Um, all of them are great contributors. Um, on the left is Jenna Betts, uh, a longtime co-conspirator of mine uh, in a variety of different projects over the years, and um, uh, uh, an accomplished nurse educator and policy person. Um, I think Dr. Satcher needs no introduction, um, but certainly um, the father of our first ever Surgeon General's report on mental health, and most importantly, or almost as importantly, um, the follow-on reports that still have legs 15 years later. This is remarkable in a policy world that's, that's moving all the time, that these things, these, these works are absolutely current today. It's, it's really remarkable. And, his leadership was pivotal in that happening. And finally, Ron Manderscheid, uh, a longtime friend and, and colleague and contributor to the Carter Center and to so many other organizations in our field, is really a, a shaker and a mover in the mental health community. And our dear friend, Lloyd Setterer. Lloyd, wish you were down, down here with us. Me too. <laughs> uh, OK. This is, uh, this is our inaugural attempt at this. So. You know, we all have our collective fingers crossed here in the program. And Lloyd, I hope we don't lose you because we, we certainly are looking forward to your contribution. With that, I'm going to end and turn it over to uh, Jenna Betts. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Mrs. Carter and the members of the Carter Center Mental Health Program, we really thank you for this incredible opportunity to connect with you all and with all of our colleagues uh, and as we all are participating in lifelong learning to improve behavioral health care in the country. Uh, now we have about an hour and a few minutes to wrap up what I think have been just a really, really important two days. And so I was trying to reflect about this and I'm thinking, well gosh, what comes to mind about the theme that the Carter Center set this year? Help wanted. Uh, ideas to improve the mental health workforce. So let's go back to um, the very beginning when Tom reminded us that the uh, behavioral health workforce Don't get distracted. Uh, has, has been in, um, the issues about that have been in process for decades and Tom said first thing there are no easy answers and then Mrs. Carter said up and came out and really helped us to identify the context of the change policy landscape about the mental health workforce post the Parity Act, post the Affordable Care Act implementation. And both of those should facilitate um, mental health and substance use services. But she reminded us very gently but very directly that stigma still uh, persists with our consumers and providers in our field. And then we had a great opportunity to hear, hear Gail Stewart's really phenomenal uh, keynote. And she called on all of us to uh, use our time together to really think about a revolution in the behavioral health. And she focused, wanted us to put all this in the context of practice, providers, settings, and education. So when we think about what we have heard as we left this room, went to plenaries, went to many plenaries, I think that we would say that here are some of the behavioral health workforce issues that we've talked about. We talked about demand. We talked about supply, which includes numbers, competencies, settings, distribution, top of license, practicing and licensing, uh, services that are accessible, affordable, and acceptable, education, recruitment, retention, reimbursement. We've talked a little about quality, especially with the focus on decreasing silos, 
increasing patient-centered uh, care, practicing through evidence-based practices, and that we in behavioral health are accountable for overall health outcomes. We talked about health in all policies and behavioral health in all health. And I think that we are all agreed in this room that there is an urgent need for the prioritization of behavioral health and implementation of uh, solutions that are real and that are immediate and that also are long lasting. So with that in mind, I'd like to start kind of at the beginning and um, Dr. Satcher, as Surgeon General, you issued several groundbreaking uh, reports on behavioral health. And what I'd like to know is the issues that were identified at the time that those were issued and the issues now, how do you see them as being the same or different? What kind of progress or lack of progress do you think we've made? Well, first we should point out that as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health, you were involved in most of those reports. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember that Jenna and I traveled to New Zealand and Australia together before we issued the report on mental health, cultural race, and ethnicity. And um, of course, in New Zealand, we, we had an opportunity to see models of cultural competence in terms of the workforce. And what I remember about Australia, of course, was the um, community-based approach. So a lot of the ideas that we have, uh, we have tried to implement. Some of them we got from other countries, and I think that's appropriate. We're talking about the global community. Uh, but the main thing we were concerned about, of course, was policy. Uh, and the first thing was parity of access to mental health services. Now, I have to tell you, uh, as we always tell our fellows, that policy change does not come easy. It was 1999 when we issued that report. And it was 2008 when uh, Congress passed the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So we have to be committed to this as a long distance run. But tremendous progress when you think about what was included in that act and what was included in the Affordable Care Act, uh, the difference that it, it has made. I have to tell this story. Uh, Patrick Kennedy in his book on the common struggle talks about the day in which um, they had this big hearing on the Hill because the Senate had not included the addiction equity in their bill and the House had both the uh, mental health and addiction equity. So they brought Mrs. Carter to Washington to try to really help uh, get this through. And, um, and he talks about how they drove, she drove up and the Washington press loves to ambush you. So when Miss Ms. Carter got out of the car, they said, they didn't ask about the act, they asked, who, who are you for in this presidential race, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama? And she said, I'm here to support Patrick Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, she's taught us a lot of lessons. But, but seriously, I think, um, even with the Affordable Care Act, where we now have you know, the, the law, we have a lot of work to do in terms of implementation, uh, in terms of rule making, in terms of making sure that insurance companies follow through, that states follow through in terms of Medicaid, uh, that Medicare follows through. So we still have a lot of work to do. The, the work is not done. But uh, we've come a long ways, and I think that's the most important thing, is that we've come a long ways, but we have to keep working and I think this discussion here about the workforce has been really critical. Uh, if we're going to enhance access the way we need to, uh, we need, we're going to need many more people in the workforce. And I happen to believe that the best models of care are the kind of models that we've talked about here. Even if we had all the psychiatrists that we needed, I believe that we need the kind of team approach to mental health care that we've been discussing here. I believe that's the best approach the most effective approach to mental health services. Thanks. Um, Ron, let me ask you, um, what do you see are the obstacles? And Lloyd, too, I'm going to ask 
you, you listen to this question because I'd like for you to both respond. What do you all see as the obstacles or barriers, in policy or otherwise, that get in the way of regular people accessing behavioral health? So I'll pick up where Dr. Satcher left off here, that on the uh, Parity Act, although it was passed in 08, we are still implementing that, and in many places, parity is not yet fully in effect. Uh, you can go and read an insurance policy, and it's very convoluted. You cannot tell whether that insurance meets parity or doesn't meet parity. So I think we still have a lot of work to do to implement parity, and I know Patrick Kennedy is working on this also, to identify places that are models where this is being done and also places where it's not. We also have a lot of work to do to implement the Affordable Care Act. Uh, some of the features of the Affordable Care Act relate to what we've talked about here. We've talked about integration. There are provisions in the Affordable Care Act to create health homes and medical homes. Uh, part of the Affordable Care Act also talks about essential community providers. Behavioral health providers are essential community providers, so you have to ask, in your own community, does your community have the essential community providers, including behavioral health providers, that the Affordable Care Act actually requires? So a lot of work to do. I want to go on and say a few other things here about some potential groups to think in terms of staffing up our workforce. So you've all heard about peers multiple times in this meeting. So I say peers, peers, peers. I agree with the idea that probably within five years or so, 20% or more of the behavioral health workforce will actually be peers. Nurses and primary care staff, 70% of all behavioral health care today doesn't occur in the behavioral health sector, it occurs already in the primary care sector. So the issue is how are we going to work better with that sector? How are we going to better utilize nurses in that sector and get more advanced practice nurses? Behavioral health providers left behind by the ACA. So as the ACA is implemented and as we ramp up accountable care organizations, I think there will be behavioral health providers who literally will be left behind, the mom and pop operations that cannot make the transition to electronic health records and larger scale and value purchasing and so on, will be left behind. We don't want them left behind. We need to incorporate them into the workforce. Baby boomers. So one of the issues that brought us here was the aging out of the workforce, and I agree with that. The average age of a psychiatrist is now about 58. The average age of a psychologist is about 57. Does that mean that the curtain is going to come down on that population and they're going to leave and you're never going to hear from them again? I don't think so. So on the other side of retirement for baby boomers are opportunities to serve as mentors, opportunities to work part-time, and opportunities to volunteer. There's a, there will be an absolutely huge baby boomer workforce here that we can rely on. So I think there are huge opportunities coming here, basically. Lloyd, would you like <coughs> to uh, speak about what you think? Can you hear me? Is it help proof of my long-distance connection? Are you I'm on Can you hear me? Now we can, sort yes. Of. Okay. okay, so let, let me first uh, start with a little story. Uh, Dr. Satcher may not remember this. It was some quite some years ago. I was, uh, and it pertains to his point about how hard and how long it takes to uh, change uh, public policy, particularly public health and public <clears throat> policy. And I had the good fortune of being on a panel with uh, Dr. Satcher when I was mental health commissioner, and I was pretty new to the job. It was my first government job. And I was bemoaning how hard it was. And he, in his wonderfully avuncular way, turned to me and said, it should be hard. He said, think of the power invested in uh, the government. Think about the implications in terms of numbers of people affected by policy that derives from uh, government or government health, uh, that it should be hard and that you've got to work to achieve those kinds of uh, aims and ambitions. Uh, so uh, that's been a uh, 
uh, a guiding uh, part of my work and, and uh, moment uh, and, and more I go back to regularly in terms of ginning up the patience to accomplish these kinds of things. So I, I just want to thank Dr. Satcher for uh, helping to, to uh, keep me uh, sane uh, and uh, out of the mental hospitals. So, it, but your question was about obstacles, and uh, one, uh, and, and I want to take a little different turn from what uh, Ron was saying here, uh, because it seems that by and large, and this is my experience having been in the not-for-profit sector, government sector, that most services for people, uh, whether it's in general medical care or specialty mental health care, are designed for the convenience uh, of the providers. And they're also designed to optimize the commerce of uh, the, uh, the organizations, the not-for-profits or the insurance companies. They are not designed to make it easy, uh, friendly, accessible uh, for patients. And I think that's a huge obstacle uh, because if you've got a disorder, whether it's a physical disorder or a mental disorder, and with a mental disorder, if you have all that kind of uh, doubt or stigma or fear about what the consequences of your condition may be, um, you, things have to be customized, have to be very different from how we've designed care. And that's where some of the the real change, I think, will happen or will, will succeed because there's going to be uh, services designed uh, to meet the uh, needs and to be uh, primarily focused to make it easier and more friendly for people to receive care. Thanks. Um, well, one of the things, uh, Ron, you and I have talked about several times is that all four of us that are on the stage and almost everybody in this audience have worked a really long time on parity. And what we find is that now that we have a parity bill, it is on steroids in the Affordable Care Act, we find so many of our colleagues uh, who have decided that they do very well without being a part of any kind of an in-network system that fits within an insurance system. So while we are, have worked to get people cards to carry around to say, I have health insurance, it has not necessarily dramatically expanded access to behavioral health services. And I, I'm wondering, I know you've been thinking about that, and even though you and Lloyd both now really work in public systems, what about the private system where people on the marketplace have a card, but they don't have providers? So let me give a few comments about the private sector under the Affordable Care Act. I also want to comment on the public sector. So the private sector, uh, I think several things are true, that uh, integration will become ubiquitous in the private sector and managed care will become ubiquitous. And as we move into those arenas, another piece of this is the Secretary's New Value Purchasing Initiative, and I think we've heard about that in this meeting as well. The value purchasing initiative will move toward what are called integrated case rates that are performance adjusted. As you move a system, an integrated system, to integrated case rates that are performance adjusted, the traditional model of managed care kind of goes away because you have to manage yourself internally. Management becomes internal. As management becomes internal, the large managed care companies are also transforming themselves from being traditional managed care companies into networks of care. So those networks of care are out in the private sector competing with some of our providers who are less organized. So our providers, I think, come at this at somewhat of a disadvantage to participate in those networks. And in some of the networks, there are problems, and we can talk about the value of, of having a very strong network, but we can also say, you know, some of these networks have phantom providers. So the same provider will be bid in five or six different networks. The provider may not even know they've been bid into the network. So these kinds of things go on, and I think we need to hold the system's toes to the fire on the essential community providers. So if you're going to offer insurance here, 
you're going to need to meet the requirements of essential community providers, including behavioral health care providers, most of whom are not in the networks now. So it seems to me that's a, a huge part of this. Uh, I, I think in the public sector, the public sector suffers more from the problems we've been talking about in this meeting, the aging out of the uh, baby boomers. So most public sector leadership positions are currently held by baby boomers. A lot of the senior clinical positions in the public sector are held by baby boomers. So we need to make the transition here for those groups to the next generation down. There's strong need for training of the next generation of leaders, the people who are 35 to 45 who tomorrow will wake up and be the directors, the clinical directors, and so on. There's also, I think, a huge opportunity, as I was saying before, to bring the baby boomers back as volunteers, part-time workers, mentors. Baby boomers can be wonderful mentors to the next generation, and we need to step up to that obligation and do that. So I think it's a very mixed bag right now, and it hasn't completely sorted itself out, and we need to be very vocal and do a lot of advocacy so it turns out in a good way, basically. Well, David, that's really what a lot of the Satcher Leadership Institute is doing. I think that the other day when you and I were just talking, you were saying that you have told everyone you came in contact with that all the work that we've done uh, in mental health, substance use issues, uh, behavioral health in all policies um, is a relay race. And I believe you said we have to be ready to pass the baton. So can you talk a little bit about how at the Leadership Institute you all are not only working on behavioral health but also uh, looking at how you can make a difference in behavioral health and health disparities? Yeah, our mission as an institute is to the develop a diverse group of leaders um, in, in medicine and public health who are committed to the elimination of disparities in health and also committed to health equity. So we, we are in the process of developing uh, skills in three levels of future leaders, we think. One, of course, to help policy people who have a background in public health and medicine <clears throat> But we decided, I guess, four years ago, that if we were really going to work effectively in the community, we need to also have a, a leadership development program for community health leaders. So we wrote pastors of churches and asked them to think about people in their congregation who could, in fact, come back and provide leadership in health promotion and disease prevention, and that they would spend 12 weeks with us one day a week. Well, 35 pastors referred themselves and came and went through our program. We've had 10 mayors to go through our program. Uh, and the third arm of our program, and then I'll get back to that, is we have a quality parenting program. And uh, you, of course, met Dr. Glenda Wren, and that quality parenting program uh, comes under the behavioral uh, health division. But the idea there is to really help parents to be more effective parents, especially between zero and five, because we believe that ultimately the parents are the most important leaders in our society. And if we could help to empower them to really uh, do an outstanding job of helping child development in that period of time, we could make the greatest difference in our society. So we now have these three leadership development programs, but each one of them has a policy on. So uh, uh, the NIH has now funded us to replicate those programs in 12 states. And in all of those states, we asked the parents to work on policy recommendations that would help them to do their jobs better. So whether you are a health professional, a community health leader, or a parent, we want you to be thinking about policy. And what are the policy implications of your work? What policy changes would, would improve your work? I want to say a word about the, the reimbursement. I've been around long enough to have seen a lot of changes. Uh, and I remember when I was in California and only 7% of the physicians would take Medicaid. And it was only after managed care came along that all of that changed. Um, I think we have to keep working with this system. Uh, and I think if we work with it and, and get it right, 
we will have psychiatrists accepting patients uh, that they're not accepting now in terms of payment, but we got to think critically about what are the policy implications, what changes do we need to make, what incentives do we need to provide in order to really assure that we have the care that we, that we need. But we've been there before. Yeah. Uh, Lloyd, you haven't been able to be with us in the la over the last two days, but one of the great comments that was made this morning was someone said we needed to think about triplets, primary care, behavioral health, and public health. And I know that you've done a lot of thinking about behavioral health and the public health model, and I wondered if you would like to say something about that. Well, I'd like to help uh, some of the wisdom that uh, seemed completely informs the, uh, the uh, Dr. Satcher's center by pointing out that the supply problems are probably so profound that while we can improve on them, we probably can't solve them. The phrase is a big question, which is, uh, uh, which, uh, is uh, uh, probably best uh, exemplified by a statement that uh, actually a British doctor made some She said, Americans can found health with health care. And uh, over time, uh, the CDC and others have worked that about 10% of health is determined by health care. And that 90% is a function of our behaviors. Uh, it's a function of our uh, Lloyd, we can't really hear you very well, but I know you're responding about the social determinants of health and public health, right? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry you can't. Can you hear me better now? That's a little better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, what I was saying was that uh, a, a British doctor uh, some time ago said that Americans can found health with health care and that indeed I was speaking about the social determinants of health. Am I coming through a little better now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and that in fact uh, it's our behaviors, how we lead our life, our environment, our built environment uh, that uh, accounts for 30-40% of our health and in fact even genetics which may uh, set the stage for our turned on and off by how we live, where we live, um, uh, through what we now know as epigenetics. So the World Health Organization claimed uh, that, in fact, when we think about social determinants, we have to think about uh, where someone is born, uh, where they grow up, where they live, their zip code, um, and where they work, and, where they, and uh, how they live their lives and age. So part of uh, this uh, closing the gap that we have now is on the demand side. And the demand side is about improving the uh, uh, risk factors, the causes of the causes, as they've been uh, declared. The reasons that we become sick, the reasons that we stay sick, the reasons that our uh, illnesses are fully managed are 90% uh, determined. Uh, by the social determinants of health. And that's very much something that's got to be a part of the solution. Because if we're going to uh, you know, uh, uh, spawn enough psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, the social workers, and peers to actually close the gap, we have to enable people to change their lives in a way that has them uh, leading healthier lives, uh, reducing their risk, Reducing demand. Yeah, David. No, I was. I served on that WHO commission on social determinants of health. And I think Lloyd makes a good point, even though I know he was not as clear as he would have liked to have been. Uh, but I think um, the interesting thing is, of course, we've been talking about workforce, and I think when you think about the implications of the social determinants of health, and we defined social determinants as the conditions in which people are born, grow, learn, live, age, and die. And those conditions have far more to do with health outcomes than health care. 
far more, um, probably 70 percent. And I think the, the question then becomes, what does that say to the healthcare team? What changes do we need to make in order to make sure that we're having an impact on the social determinants of health? Uh, health equity is the opportunity to be healthy, to be optimally healthy. And in order for that to be true, I can't just write a prescription, as I have done, recommending that people be physically active five days a week, 30 minutes a day. I've also got to be concerned about, is the community safe enough for them to get out and walk or to run? I think that's what this is saying. So what are the implications of that for the workforce of the future? Uh, who are our new partners and collaborators as we try to impact not only health care, but healthy environments and health equity? Comment on that as well. So I think, you know, we've talked a lot about population health here uh, in several of the sessions over the last several days of taking a population and partitioning it from people who are totally well to people who have catastrophic illness. Population health is a very close cousin of public health, meaning when you partition that population, you can actually introduce community interventions to address the issues of these various groups, and they will not be the same. So in the future workforce of behavioral health, we are going to need to work much more closely with public health, and I think a lot more people who are in behavioral health will also have training in public health. I'm beginning to see students now who come to me and say, well, you know, I'd like to have a joint degree in social work and public health where can I go to get that degree? And there are, in fact, a number of universities that now offer these cross degrees. And I think we're going to see a lot more of those type of people in the workforce going forward who are able to deal with the disparities and equity in communities that Dr. Satcher is talking about here. It's very exciting, actually. You know, in some ways, this is about not just team care within a medical practice, what's been called teams of teams, so that, in fact, as Dr. Satcher was saying, that that healthcare team needs to work uh, with the faith-based community, needs to work with the police, needs to work uh, with people in social services, because together, those are the teams, actually, that will make an impact on the social determinants of health and mental health, and actually be more effective than just trying to uh, orchestrate this uh, from a, a, a physician's office. Well, one of the things that I think is uh, a really a very interesting piece is to try to decide where the driver of that is going to come from. If it's not in the public system, but it's in the private system, who's going to be organizing that? Is it going to be big insurance companies? Is it going to be communities that take responsibility and say they want to have a not-for-profit that's running both their social services and their health system? What are some of the innovations that you see about the, the um, coordination of the delivery system? So, uh, quick answer here. So, uh, what we talk about now actually goes beyond the integration of primary care and behavioral health. We talk about the integration of everything. And by that we mean, how do you bring together the pieces of the health delivery system, the behavioral health delivery system, the social service system, and other functions in the community to meet the needs of a community population in the way that Dr. Satcher is talking about. A number of communities are taking this on. For example, the National Association of Counties has a Healthy Counties Initiative. And in the Healthy Counties Initiative, we have 200 counties in the United States who've taken this on, where they are literally putting those pieces together as counties. So in some instances, it's going to be, you know, the community coming together. In the county example, in some instances, it will be companies coming together. I think of a company in behavioral health like Optum or Centene, where they are building these systems as well. It's being built on both sides. I guess it, it may be a little bit of a problem that it's not probably coordinated as much as it ought to be between, you know, what's happening in the 200 counties that are doing the initiative and what the private sector is currently doing, but they're all generally moving in the same direction here. I just want to say, now, this is a, a perfect example of the gap between policy and practice. Mm -hmm. In fact, as the Affordable Care Act was being put together, 
the then Surgeon General, Regina Benjamin, was heading a council of people who were looking at how can we impact the social determinants of health? How can we make communities healthier? And some of you remember they ended up with a budget, I guess, of $15 billion over five years that would be invested. It was in the CDC's budget. Congress has taken almost every penny of that money out because uh, many people in Congress don't believe that the government should be doing those kinds of things. They say those are personal responsibilities. So it's going to make it difficult. Uh, but on the positive side, there have been places like Louisville, for example, who had rezoning in order to make sure that there were safe places for every child to yeah. play. And there were grocery stores within the reach of every family. So we have good news and bad news, but a lot of bad news in terms of how that prevention agenda has been dealt with in Congress. Right, and I think it is pretty clear that any group such as Congress that's still arguing about whether everybody should have access to health insurance would ever get down in the weeds and agree that we need to deal with some of these yeah. issues about the social determinants of health. It's going to be difficult. I mean, it's going to be really a hard, a hard slog. Now, as a nurse, let me just say an easy policy change, but boy, we've worked on this a, a long time, and my nurse colleagues in the audience can um, uh, attest to this. You know, we have such a need for the work, uh, an expanded workforce. I see in my own uh, life nurses who are coming back for their DNPs, and no matter what they were in before, they're all coming back in mental health because they know what's wrong with the people they're seeing. But when they become a DNP or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, they're still hampered by these barriers in some states of uh, the medical lobby not wanting them to have full scopes of practice. And that's just one example. And Ron and I were talking about this, and he said, and this happens with other disciplines also. Yes. So that's a state licensing issue. We've heard uh, all through the meeting about people practicing to the full scope of what they know and their skill set. But licensing, I think, is a barrier that we need to kind of put on the table and not let it just go unattended. So there's, there's an interesting historical example example of this. So I, I had the opportunity to work on Clinton health reform at the time that it was being put together. And one of the work groups that I worked on, and Jen, I think you were involved in this as well, was the work group on human resources. And there was a fork in the road. One fork in the road was to continue the process that we had done historically, which is to vest all licensure in the states and allow all the variability that exists from state to state in licensure practice and so on, or go the other way and say we need to develop national standards here, and there needs to be one standard of licensure for psychiatrists throughout the U.S., nurses and so on. Uh, I think most people in the room agreed we would be better off if we had national standards. However, they said, well, you know, if we simply did this, this would probably sink the Clinton health reform bill because we're loading it up with too much. So. The decision was made to go with the other approach, meaning leaving it as it is, and now, you know, 15 years later, you're continuing to reap problems from this. Uh, I think one positive thing on the horizon, and that occurred in this meeting as well, the new center at HRSA, the Center on Behavioral Health Workforce, has as one of its missions looking at the scope of practice for the different behavioral health disciplines state by state so we can actually put this on one map and understand this so we can begin doing the advocacy to begin changing the limitations that you're talking about. So that's not a perfect answer, but at least there's a step being taken, you know, to help with this. As a, as a uh, state government employee, I actually think it's at the level of the state governments where the greatest gains can be made because not only uh, do states control licensing of of individual professionals, even more importantly, states control licensing of health systems, of hospitals, of clinics, whereby states can exercise some control, some standards by which licensing is uh, provided and uh, monitored. Uh, moreover, uh, states uh, also are in a position to, um, uh, because of uh, Medicaid, uh, and much of uh, the health care for the people, the most disadvantaged is paid for by Medicaid. Uh, 
our uh, states are in position to set policy, to set financial uh, uh, incentives uh, to reach uh, the very high need people, uh, people where there are disparities. There are inequities. So states are very well, uh, th those areas of state government uh, control are pretty much. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if, you, if you've lost me. Uh, no, we're no you. you're there. We're here. So I'm so just saying this is, I think, uh, not necessarily a federal issue, much more uh, the biggest opportunity. I at the states, and they're going to be very different. Okay, well, my my comment to that is, let's get on with it. We we've struggled with some of these barriers uh, for uh, for too long in terms of what the states could do. Yes, they could do it, so let's let them do it. And if they're not going to do it wholesale, then I think at least in behavioral health, um, this is the perfect time to do it. Um, Tom, are we going to take questions from the audience, or are we just going to go forward? Okay, well, let's, would you all like to have about a five-minute opportunity to speak with our panelists, and then we're going to let them close by telling us what they think are the most likely next step solutions, and then they want to send you on your way with a little charge to the group. Yes, please. I'm um, sorry, I didn't attend yesterday, but with regard to work, mm. is there a trend towards using more behavioral health as a broader mortgage as opposed to mental health? Because if you look at it globally, in Queen's English, mental is, you know, in numerous terms, is equated with long term. You know what I mean? That's what Yesterday, we did set a definition of behavioral health that I think that we all pretty much agreed with, which is both uh, health, absence of illness, and we're looking at mental disorders, we're looking at substance use disorders, and we're also looking at the absence of those and a sense of well-being. Yeah. Do you want to just share the definition that we used in the Surgeon Jill's report? Mental health is... Yeah, we define mental health as the successful performance of mental functions such that one could be productive in his or her life and work, but also importantly, one could develop and maintain fulfilling relationships with others. And be, we also be said, resilient. Yeah, we also said that uh, mental health meant that one could adapt to change. And a lot of the mental health problems that we see, as you know, sort of begin when people are going through the major changes in their lives, including adolescence, mm -hmm. by the way. And then one could deal with adversity. I, I, I thought about that when Hurricane Katrina took place in New Orleans, and we saw depression increase from 10% to 30%. So often, when it comes to mental health, uh, you know, we see the challenges uh, and how people respond to them. So. I think the day will come when we will be much more effective in prevention than we have been. And uh, one area that we need much more work is with children. Mm -hmm. can I, and I think uh, we can make some real progress. Yes. Comment. I, 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 I just want to say that one of the outstanding things I think that we put in the Surgeon General's report and then followed up on the special report on children and youth is that serious mental illnesses, 50% occur by the age of 14. Think about the opportunity for pediatricians and school teachers and kindergarten teachers to really make a difference in the, li the f lives of our, of, uh, our country in the future. Well, Ron I just want to say, I like, uh, responding to the question, I like behavioral health because I think it's broader and I think we need to deal more broadly with this issue. Mm -hmm. In Chicago the other day, I pointed out that we, we get really upset when there's a mass shooting and we ask about mental health implications. So I asked, what about these young kids who are killing each other on the street? Uh, many of them on drugs, but if black <coughs> boys are killing each other on the streets of Chicago, there's something wrong with that in terms of behavioral health. If, if you uh, devalue yourself to that extent, so I think we've got to deal more broadly with, 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 
the, the issues that we're dealing with. And I think that means looking at behavior, looking at behavioral health. It was 20 years ago, or oh, that program that Ms. Carter was talking about, but it was 20 years ago when we appointed the first behavioral health associate director at the CDC. I know that because last week they invited me back there to celebrate the 20th anniversary. But, but dealing with it from the standpoint of behavioral health, I think, is the appropriate yes. approach. It's, it's a great comment for CDC. Absolutely. Ron, mm -hmm. did you want to respond? Well, the, the comment I want to add to this, it's not a response, I want to add to it. I, th I think we're at a crossroads in the underlying definitions here. So we have built our definitions up in this area from deficit-based thinking. And we've done that for decades and decades. There's an opportunity to move the agenda to strength-based definitions and thinking, and I think we should push that. Health is a complete state of mental, physical, social, and spiritual well-being. It isn't about deficits, basically. So if we're going to move from uh, the disease care system to the health care system, we have to move from deficit thinking to positive thinking. There may be actually some opportunities to do that. I know Ben Druss is very involved in a committee at the National Academy of Sciences to look at the definition of how nationally we define adults with serious mental illness. I think part of that relook needs to be, should we be looking at it from a deficit point of view or a positive point of view? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, what would each of you say are the implementable solutions to states or health organizations really be able to begin now to address the, the um, behavioral health workforce? Uh, I'm troubled by the fact that everybody on the stage is a baby boomer, and we've been saying really bad <laughs> things about baby boomers and their work when I was expecting to work for a long time. So what, what do you all think? Well, I think a lot of great things have been said at this conference that are going to be very helpful. Um, I'm passionate about working earlier, and so the Quality Parenting Program recognizes that we've got to do a better job with children. Um, in, the, uh, in the report that we did on social determinants of health, Gail Walensky and I wrote a, a piece in the Journal of Health Affairs, and one of the things that stood out for me is that we pointed out that when you really think about it, the brain, the development of the brain is virtually sculptured by nutrition, things that we, we take for granted in this country too often, that if, if children don't get the right nutrition earlier, earlier, they don't get the right interaction with adults early, they grow up with a deficit. And I think that's where I think we've got to start, that's where I think we've got to use our best workforces <coughs> Uh, and I think, as you pointed out earlier, maybe before we got up here, there is an issue in terms of the treatment of children with mental disorders and the intervention to try to improve mental health in children, or behavioral health, I guess. Ron? So, you know, when I came to this meeting, I came, I guess, with kind of a trepidation that we were looking at an issue that we've been trying to do something about for a very long time. I know I've been involved in working in this back in the days when I was a Fed and so on long ago. And I'm going to leave with a very optimistic point of view because I think we have redefined the problem from being simply a problem of needing more people to a problem of changing the nature of the system that we're dealing with. And I think that change, which is helped by the Affordable Care Act and is helped by the parity legislation, is helped by the peer movement and all we've learned about recovery, can help us move the agenda ahead in a very positive way. So I want to leave with a very positive outcome from this that I think this meeting has changed the definition of the problem that we came with originally. And I want to thank Mrs. Carter for hosting the meeting to make this possible to actually do this. Give her a nice hand. Here, Lloyd, what would what, um, so, are you thought? Well, uh, your, your charge to us early on was to uh, be some action, uh, something actionable. And right. I'm going to ask uh, her to. Uh, Focus at the state governments uh, that 
focusing focused in two particular areas and for this topic. So, for example, um, what uh, what can states do to incentivize uh, people to enter behavioral health fields to stay to stay in those fields and to practice? in areas where we know uh, right now there is not a good supply and that those, those actions have to do with loan repayment, they have to do with certain bonuses for location and, and uh, even states could be creative about state the, the tax relief that you, as long as you work in those areas, you don't have to pay state taxes. A variety of financial incentives for to go to school and not, not be driven to uh, very private uh, practice models in order to get the uh, income to cover the debt um, that uh, they accrue. Uh, uh, psychiatrists in the public sector. Uh, in public uh, education, leave medical school at training with $153,000 a year, private training, 8000 a year. These are unsupportable uh, debts uh, that could make a difference in terms of bringing people into behavioral health. State license. Well, uh, uh, okay, we've lost you. I'm sorry. So, I'll leave it with the two of you. We, we've had a wonderful two days, and I think that we all have a shared sense of the, the problems. I think that we all feel a tremendous sense of urgency about solving these problems. And I'm wondering if I could start with you, Ron, and then go to David. What would be your final charge to this group as they head home, uh, either me on I-75, which I don't think I'll be going very fast, or uh, a lot of time back to, think, to Nashville, basically. or people flying all back across the country. What should we be thinking of before we meet here again next year? So let me start. Uh, so I think, you know, Gail Stewart said this, and so I'm kind of channeling her here. And, and when she concluded her talk, she said, you know, there's kind of two levels of solution here. One level of solution is what you do locally. And the other level of solution is what needs to be done nationally. And every one of us can go home and do things locally in our own system. So, you know, to Dr. Satcher's point, if you live in a community that has a very high poverty rate, what can you do about that? What, what about the children in that community? Are those children being given the best chance to become adults in American society? So, and, you know, in your own behavioral health system, do, you know, do you have peers in that system? Are you working with the federally qualified health centers? There's all of these questions which you all know that we've talked about over the several days that make the system real. You are the system. I always say, you know, all health care is local. So if I had a heart attack right now and fell over, they would take me probably to Grady Hospital and I would live or die, depending on how good the care is at Grady Hospital. It's outstanding. And it, it's good. I'd probably live then, basically. So I, I think, you know, the charge is to go home and, and actually begin doing some of these things ourselves. Don't wait for these things to happen nationally. You can do them yourself, and I'm very optimistic about that. Thanks, Ron. David? Well, we have a saying at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, which I like to refer to, and we basically say that in order to eliminate disparities in health, achieve health equity, we need leaders who first care enough we also need leaders who know enough, leaders who have the courage to do enough, and leaders who will persevere until a job is done. I think you're here because you care about yeah, this issue. Yeah, yeah. And all of us need to continue to learn, and I think we've learned a lot uh, while being here. And I just hope that you will persevere until a job, a job is done. It is a long distance run, by the way. And it's a relay race. It's both. And I think we have to look at it that way. Yeah. Here, here. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Uh, very insightful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.
And Lloyd, uh, we're so sorry we had breakup in communications, but thank you for being with us as well. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'm going to invite Mrs. Carter to come up and, and give some closing remarks as our panel leaves. Thank you, panel. Great work. I don't like to change the subject from the panel we just heard and the things we did today, but I just talked to Tom Ensel, and I thought you all might like to know, you who don't know um, what he's doing, uh, that you might like to know. And uh, I read um, a couple of weeks ago that he was retiring from the National Institute of Mental Health and going to work for Google. So I called him this afternoon, and I said, I don't know what you, you can do for Google. <laughs> um, <laughs> But he said that they have uh, Google Live Life Sciences and that um, they have a program on diabetes. I think he said heart problems, but a couple. And they're just beginning a program on mental health, on uh, Google Life Sciences uh, TV. So I told him not to forget us. <laughs> if he's doing something, I think we all want to be kind of involved in a little bit. Well, I think Jenna did a, a great job of summing up um, what we've been doing, our activities, and what we've done, um, learned over the last two days. And then she did a good job, Jenna, um, of the last panel. And Lloyd, I want to t tell you too that I'm sorry about the uh, um, problem with the TV reception, but uh, we're still really glad to have heard you. And we heard enough to, that you said um, that was helpful. So, um, well, I think, you know, every year I think this is the best symposium we've ever had. <laughs> and then I come back the next year and I think this is the best symposium we've ever had. But I think it was a really great one. And, it, and because the subject that, that has been on our minds, on everybody's minds for decades, as Tom said, um, uh, was so interesting. And so I do think that I... I came, I'm leaving, going home with a little more positive attitude than I had about what's going to happen in the future um, because of learning about programs going on in the country, some successful programs, and with a lot of ideas and new ideas, innovative ideas about what can be done. And I hope and think that we can go home and, and get these programs um, start thinking about them and thinking about what each of you can do in your community, uh, in your organizations, uh, to help um, get these programs um, going. We, we, we know a lot now, and, um, and we have a lot of people uh, out there who are concerned about the workforce, and uh, just be really good for us to spread the word around that there are some good programs going on there and a lot of different, everything has changed of course, and a lot of different um, ideas, so I'm pleased about that. Um, I want to thank our funders again. There's no way we could have had this um, meeting. We, no way we can do, could do the things we do without them. And so I'm going to um, go over them again. Um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and somebody here, I see one person in the back. <laughs> well, Tom's daughter is here with us. I don't know, she, 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 she's SAMHSA, yeah. This is Tom's daughter, and she's with SAMHSA, <laughs> so. <laughs> the Commonwealth Fund. Anybody here from the Commonwealth Fund? I don't think there was last night. Health, Healthcare Georgia Foundation. Uh, Optum. Here she is. <laughs> SAMHSA. So you, you, we did have a representative here. And, and many other generous um, individual donors. Um, and I want to now thank 
all the presenters, everybody was so good. We just had, and, and I want to, and I want to thank the planning committee. The planning committee um, did a great job, and the staff. I think we ought to have the planning committee and the staff and Tom um, stand up and let us give them a good word. <laughs> and finally, um, we want you to be sure to fill in the outline, uh, the follow-up online survey. Um, we, we pay attention to that, and we'd like very much for you to express your thoughts and reactions and any suggestions that we have about how we can do a better job. And with that, I'm going to say um, safe journey home, and we are adjourned. Thank all of you. Thank all of you.